going. What do you think you're doing, son? The lawyer replied, I've just shot a duck and it landed in your field and I'm going to retrieve it. And the farmer said, you ain't going to retrieve the duck in my field, son. You see, once that duck lands in my field, it's my duck. Well, the lawyer said, look, I'm a, I'm a pretty good lawyer and I'll tell you what, if you don't give me the duck, I'm going to sue you and I'll sue the shirt off your back and I'll make sure I get that duck. And the farmer said, son, you just don't know how it's done down here in Texas, do you? You see, we have what we call the free kick rule. The three kick rule, what's that? Well, this is how it works, son. You see, I kick you three times. And then you kick me three times. And then I kick you three times. And so on and so on until we both get tired and we get a winner. Well, the lawyer thinks to himself, I can take this old guy easily. So he says out loud to the farmer, Okay, old man, let's go for it. The farmer climbed out of his truck, came close to the lawyer, and without any warning, gave him a swift kick in the old bottom drawer, which doubled the lawyer over. He goes down to the ground. The farmer follows this with another mighty hard kick to the man's abdomen. Oh, it's rolling around. And he finishes off with an equally hard kick to his back. The lawyer is laying there flat here on the ground. Through all the terrible pain he's enduring, he said to himself, I can't let this crazy old man win. So he musters up every last bit of strength that he has, stands up and he says to the other man, all right, farmer, it's my turn. And the farmer replies, that's okay, son, you keep the duck. <laughs> that's what's happening in the book that we're going to look at this afternoon. One society's down and suffering terribly. The other party just wants to kick the monster down and keep on kicking more and more. Some years ago, I came across a 19th century German word in a book I was reading, and I was quite intrigued with this word, particularly more so when I got to find out what it actually meant from the German point of view. The word is Schadenfreude. There's a few mutterings here. Hans and Heidi's probably not here, so I got away with that one. Essentially, it's gloating at someone else's bad experience. It's smug pleasure taken in someone's misfortune. In English, we'd say malicious joy. It's the experience of pleasure, self-satisfaction that comes from learning or witnessing the troubles, the failures or humiliation of another. Well, as I say, the message today is about one particular group of people throughout a period of Old Testament history that have literally been kicking the Israelites when they were down, mistreating them and taking advantage of them at every opportunity as the Israelites struggled with their enemies. God takes note of such events and as always he will call them to account. Now that's one theme. The other dominant theme that I see in this, in this uh, certainly this book will become evident in a few minutes. But I'll read a few words from C.S. Lewis, who I think puts it in a nutshell. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people, except Christians, ever imagine that they are guilty themselves. I've heard people admit that they are bad-tempered or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink or even that they are cowards. I do not think I've ever heard anyone who is not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. And at the same time, I've very seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. There's no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves and the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The vice he was talking about is pride or self-conceit. 
A word that Proverbs 6, verse 17, places at the very first of the sinful behaviours that God finds despicable. I'll again quote the commentator J. Oswald Sanders in one of his books said this, Nothing is more distasteful to God than self-conceit. That first and fundamental sin, in essence, aims at enthroning self at the expense of God. And don't forget that the very first sin in the Bible wasn't those two in the garden. It was Lucifer before then who said, I want to be just like you. To be a tad blunt, you might be saying to yourself, what are you telling me for? I don't have a, the least problem with pride. Well, that's possible. However, one of the biggest problems with pride is that it may be easy to detect in another person, but sadly, somewhat difficult to recognize in our own lives. And I certainly include myself in that comment. Somewhat, thank you, Jack. Someone has said, pride is so insidious that we often take pride in the fact that we think we have overcome pride in our own lives. Let's just pray for a moment, shall we, before we open the word. Father, we thank you for your word. It's a treasure house, and we keep on finding treasure in there. Every time we look, there is something new, something more valuable to get a hold of and cherish. And as we just explore this book in a few minutes, I just pray, Lord, that uh, you will hide the speaker and that people might just see the truths that are contained in these verses. May we just put any distractions that we've brought in from outside to one side so that we might focus, give us ears, give us eyes, and give us a heart that's receptive for your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to the shortest book in the Old Testament. The wheels and the cogs are turning. I can hear a few squeaks. All right, let me help you a little bit. He's sandwiched between Amos and Jonah. It's the book of Obadiah. One of the minor prophets. He's not a prophet that we hear too much about, or make reference to, or even spend much time in deep debate. However, though his book is the shortest one in the Old Testament, it's only 21 verses, it indeed is very interesting and has a pointed message, not just to the recipients of this prophecy, but to us all. Blatant pride, okay. Who was he? Well, let me provide some background on the prophet Obadiah. There is no background on the old <laughs> prophet Obadiah. Well, that's a good start. Well, let's try a few other things. I've spent some time on this, and I made a little list about him, right, which might be useful. Where was he born? We don't know. When did he live? We don't know. Who were his parents? We don't know. It's a little list of we don't knows, isn't it? Right? If a certain pastor at this church approaches you and asks you who exactly was Obadiah the prophet, you might just get away by simply saying, we don't know. You know, we'd usually expect something about the author accompanying his name at the beginning of each prophetical book. And there might be the father's name, perhaps an ancestor, even his hometown. Another thing, it's interesting that any personal descriptive information is absent in just two of the prophetical books. That's this one and Malachi. Some argue, and of course there's always a few pop out the cupboards with these things, isn't it, to argue, and claim that possibly the book was, or has more than one author, as it has more than one prophecy in it. But really, it knits together far too well for that to even hold any water. All right, what can we say and what, if anything, can be examined to shed any sort of light on this prophet, Obadiah? Well, as I say, the scriptures are 
silent about it, as they sometimes are. We do know that from his name, um, there's no B in Hebrew, so really, to be absolutely correct, we should be calling him Ovadiah. What we'll call him Obadiah, because we always call him Obadiah, and we get away with it. Unless uh, I get any uh, backlash from somebody who's in Meriden uh, about that one. The name translates as servant of Yahweh or worshipper of Yahweh. So we know something about him from his name. It's very descriptive. There are somewhere in the region of about 12 Obadiahs in the Old Testament. Some say 13, but I only think 12. And one of these, which I'm going to share with you, might be the Obadiah who wrote this book. There was an Obadiah who was an officer in King Ahab of Israel's court. He hid uh, God's prophets in a cave. That's first Kings. There was an Obadiah who was sent out by King Jehoshaphat of Judah to reach the, uh, teach the law in the cities of Judah. That's two chronicles. There was an Obadiah who was one of the overseers who helped with the repairs to the temple in the days of Josiah, the king of Judah, two chronicles. There was an Obadiah who was a priest in the days of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 10. Well, you get the idea. I'm not going to read the rest of them. I just, we haven't got time. However, the Obadiah in question is believed to be none of these just mentioned. So again, we have a particular real, no real in, in insight into him, sorry. But we're not giving in. We'll, we'll try and be like Bereans and just try and keep going and do a little bit more research. But remember too, it's God, not the prophet, who remains the focus of this particular book. I did come across one comment that according to the Jewish Talmud, Obadiah is said to have been a convert to Ju uh, Judaism from Edom. And so also was a descendant of Eliphaz, the friend of Job. Now, if that's true, then it makes Obadiah's message a little bit more intriguing since he would be bringing this prophetic message to his own people when we get to it. Some comments from Clint Archer. Nestled in the uncharted backwaters of the minor prophets, Obadiah and Obadiah's missive to Edom is like a rare bird. Experts can be expected to appreciate it, but most folks are barely aware of its existence. He goes on to say, Obadiah is the spleen of the Old Testament. We know it's there, but most of us are hazy about its role in the body. He then goes on and writes, any time the innocent are targeted en masse and we're left waiting for justice to be done, the book of Obadiah reassures us that God never relegates unresolved injustices to a shelf of cold cases. He never forgets. Well, there's an early clue. Obadiah's posting a warning against Edom. Well, that's interesting because he's not targeting the Israelites. He's specifically and directly targeting another nation. Well, whoever he was, he certainly possessed some literary talent because he was capable of employing the skills of imagery, metaphor, simile, all English expressions, of course, of making comparisons in various ways. He used irony, he used repetition, he used various forms of parallelism, which is an Old, old Testament uh, technique, uh, particularly which is available in the, the likes of the, uh, the Psalms. Claire Smith informs us that Obadiah uses several key words and phrases to de depict God's coming judgment on the Edomites. For example, he uses the word day 12 times to prophesy a future time in which God will vindicate his justice on Edom for their sins against the people of Israel. He says twice that Edom would be cut down or cut off. The proper name for God, Yahweh, also appears seven times in the book, highlighting God's covenantal promises to love and protect his people against all enemies that would curse them. Now, any reasonable attempt to try and date the book of Obadiah with any degree of certainty well and truly places you in a sphere of uncertainty. 
Far better knowledgeable, learned scholarly people than me have tried to date this book, and it's just dates against dates and argument against argument. In fact, I shouldn't even include myself in that statement there. They've argued back and forth over many years about which period he's actually referring to. So let me explain a little bit of this. The problem arises because it had a focus on an invasion of Jerusalem. You see, and some of you of course will know this, there was more than one invasion on Jerusalem. And that's where the problem starts. Obadiah gives very little away towards any reasonable clues as to when his invasion actually occurred. Of course, dating the correct invasion helps us to date when he was alive. I found the commentator, Dr. Thomas Constable, very helpful in this search because he gave away three clues that he feels are, is relevant to at least maybe date, maybe date. Firstly, references to historical events in the book. Secondly, the, the book's place in the Hebrew canon. And the, thirdly, the possible quotations or else references to the writings of other Old Testament prophets in Obadiah, as well as any quotations or references to Obadiah in other Old Testament books. I'm trying not to overload you with this, all right? I had some hair when I started this one. I'm, just, I'm sure you'll catch on. What we're interested in is, is the behavior of the Edomites over time and what will take place. All right, let me just go back quickly to the first clue. He refers to a time in the apparently recent past when the Edomites had gloated over a successful invasion of Jerusalem. Now, the seven occasions during the ministry of the writing prophets that when we know Jerusalem experienced invasion and suffered a defeat. One of these may be the event Obadiah refers to. Now don't hold your breath, but here we go, briefly as possible. I'm not gonna give any scriptural references because it, will just, it, will, it would drag on a little bit more than we need to. I've brought it down to four, most likely and the most likely popular ones. I'll give John MacArthur a little bit of uh, reference here because uh, he's explained it quite well. Obadiah apparently wrote shortly after the attack. There were four significant invasions of Jerusalem in Old Testament history. Shishak, king of Egypt, 925 BC. Secondly, by the Philistines and the Arabians, 848 to 841 BC. That was when Jehoram of Judah was there. Thirdly, Jehoash, king of Israel, circa 790 BC. And fourthly, we know this one, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, 586 BC. Now of these four, only the second and the fourth are possible fits with the historical data. I'll clear that in a minute. Number two is preferable, which is the Philistines and the Arabians. Number two is preferable because Obadiah's description doesn't indicate the total destruction of the city, which took place under Nebuchadnezzar's attack. Also, although the Edomites were involved in Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem, it's significant that Obadiah doesn't mention the Babylonians by name, as with all the other prophets who wrote about Jerusalem's fate. Nor is there any reference to the destruction of the temple or the deportation of the people. In fact, the captives appear to have possibly been taken to the southwest, not east to Babylon. All right, so what he said was two choices. It's either got to be the attack by the Philistines and the Arabians in the ninth century or the later attack by the Babylonians, 586. You've got that side going, oh, well, we think it's that one. And then we've got these, these people going, no, we think it's that one. To repeat, these past invasions and defeats, the two invasions that seemed to best fit his description of Edomite's behavior were the one in King Jehoram's reign, that's the ninth century one, and the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. 
Many scholars, commentators, and even preachers believe that one of these instances is in view, and they often tend to lean towards the destruction of Jerusalem, 586 BC. However, not everyone agrees, and I've just quoted one of them, who goes for the earlier date in the ninth century. <clears throat> and he's not on his own because, as I say, there are others who agree with him. You see, ultimately, it doesn't make any difference because of the context of what this prophecy is. It doesn't really matter. Unless you accept the earlier one of the ninth century, and that puts Obadiah in the time period of Elijah and Elisha and puts him as one of the earliest prophets. Second clue, very quickly, the Hebrew canon. I don't know why we call them minor prophets. They're always, they've always got something major to talk about, haven't they? It's never, never an ordinary day at the prophet's office when these guys are around. The Jews put all 12 of the minor prophets on one scroll for convenience and to keep them from getting lost. I think I should do that when I write up my jobs list. Anyway, in order in which they appear in the Hebrew Bible is basically chronological. And this order continued in later translations of the Old Testament, including the English ones. This would lead us to conclude that the ancient Jews regarded Obadiah as one of the earlier prophetical books. Now, as I say, it's not completely chronological. Hosea seems to have been put there first because he's the longest one, but he's pre-exile of the minor prophets. But the recurrence of similar themes and words also appear to have influenced the order since Joel, rather than Amos, the second longest pre-exilic minor prophet follows Hosea. So have a look through the list sometime and just see, you can see them. You can see where they're broken down into pre-exile prophets, prophets during the exile and the post-exile ones. It's most enlightening. Third clue, the possible date of Obadiah. There's a few little bits of evidence, a few little crumbs here, that one prophet evidently could have depended on another. There are marked similarities between Obadiah verses 1 to 9 and the book of Jeremiah, chapter 49. There's also a few verses that crop up in the book of Joel. What does that mean? Well, there are indications that Jeremiah could possibly have had Obadiah's prophecy in front of him as he wrote and ministered. Or is it the other way around? Was Obadiah using some of Jeremiah's text? Well, if they're referring to the same time period, Obadiah obviously could be a contemporary of Jeremiah. And so they're both writing about the Babylonian conquest, 586 BC. But Obadiah's prophecy is written as if the event has already taken place. Jeremiah's writings are prophesying what will happen in the near future. And that's, again, an argument why some people say, well, we think he's a ninth century prophet. It's also worth pointing out Obadiah's text references are in a block. Jeremiah's comments are scattered. So the indication there again could well be that Obadiah came before Jeremiah. And as I said earlier on, if that's the case, then we were locking him into Elijah and Elisha. Something to think about, but bear in mind, everybody, there's two sides to this argument, you know. I think we can take the right view that the Holy Spirit simply led each prophet independently to their writings so that they could express themselves and as it happens sometimes in similar terms if need be and if God so desired. All scripture is God breathed to Timothy chapter 3 and 16 tells us it's God who inspired every word through his spirit. None of the scripture is of any private interpretation no prophecy of scripture 
comes from someone's own interpretation. That's referenced in 2 Peter chapter 1. The same Holy Spirit that gave Jeremiah the words to write gave Obadiah the words to write as well. And wouldn't that make proper sense? Well, it would for me. Okay, as I said, it's not absolutely crucial with these dates, but I've, I haven't tried to string you along the garden path too much. And you say, well, we, we wanted an answer. You know, we get answers when Stuart's here. But on this occasion, it's just too much of a theological argument in one sense, but it's very intriguing, I find, when you look at the evidences on both sides. Right. As I said earlier, one of the things that makes this prophecy different is the fact that he's not talking to the Jewish people directly, he's talking to this other nation, although it might have been a bit of a comfort to the Israelites when they read it. It's to their distant cousins. Cousins who saw what was happening and never lifted a finger to assist or support the plight. They took advantage of every opportunity for self-gain. They just kept kicking the folks from Judah every time they were down on the ground, looking for a helping hand to stand up again, and they just kept kicking them. Before we begin the book proper, we need a few minutes to remind ourselves of the two brothers Esau and Jacob. Back in Jack, uh, Genesis chapter 5, we have the birth of these twins, <clears throat> although they weren't identical, of course, they were fraternal. Even then, when Rebecca was carrying them in her pregnancy, there was evidence of them struggling in her womb. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. There's a prophecy right there. And of course, in Jude due course of time, that came about. You recall that when the boys were born, Esau was the first of the two to appear. He was described as red all over like a hairy garment, a baby that was red and hairy. You have to wonder what that baby perhaps looked like, don't you? Red and hairy. What sort of image does that conjure up in your mind? Oh, well, not quite that red and hairy. <laughs> Jacob was then born, and as this took place, his hand took hold on Esau's heel. Esau saw a name because it referred to the hairiness and his hair color, of course. Jacob's name coming from the idea of a heel catcher. And that meant something in those days. It points towards the idea of a trickster, a con man. It certainly wasn't a compliment by a long shot. And we follow the story through, of course, from Chapter 25, we have the familiar events of Esau giving away his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of red pottage. Such was his attitude towards it. Chapter 27, we have the deceptive plot between Jacob and his mother, Rebekah, where the father, Isaac, gives Jacob his official blessing instead of the oldest son, Esau. Don't you find it interesting that Esau didn't place any value on his birthright when it had any sort of spiritual aspect of value, but now when it becomes a thing of material wealth and political terms, he wants it badly. He complained that he'd been supplanted two times, yet failed to take responsibility for the fact that on the first occasion, he actually despised his birthright, selling it to Jacob for a bowl of food. He gave it away. Well, it was really God's privilege to give the birthright to whom he chose anyway, and that came about in due course. Does God want us to stumble along when we haven't truly thought things out or sought his counsel? Of course not, never. Does he ever need us to sin to help fulfill his plan in our lives? Of course not, never. Interestingly enough, in chapter 33 of Genesis, those two brothers reconcile to each other, and Esau receives a temporal blessing, although not a spiritual one. All right, I won't spend much more time on Esau, as his name, of course, became Edom, and Jacob, of course, 
became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's fair to say that they, where the land of Edom is located lends itself to a bit more information because it, it does influence what's in the rest of the, in these verses. Chapter 20, uh, sorry, chapter 33 of Genesis, Esau parts from Jacob and he heads off to Mount Seir. Seir was a prominent, fairly inaccessible establishment. And these days, of course, we know it better as Petra. It's surrounded by rugged rock and jagged riches, ridges. <laughs> it's got riches as well. It keeps things safe. That stronghold at Petra was lost to Western eyes for nearly 1,000 years until rediscovered in 1812 by Johann Burckhardt, the Swiss explorer. In order to enter and gain permission from the locals, he had to offer the sacrifice of a goat to Aaron on the traditional site of Aaron's tomb. Well, I think the entry admission is a bit easier these days, a bit cheaper probably. Mount Seir, or the land of Seir, was originally inhabited by the Horites, troglodytes, cave dwellers, who were doubtless the excavators of those singular rock dwellings found in such numbers in the ravines and cliffs around Petra. They were dispossessed and apparently annihilated by the descendants of Esau. So the history of Seir merges into that of Edom. Though the country was afterwards called Edom, it's easy to see its connection due to the overall redness of the surrounding terrain. Over time, there's an obvious, a very obvious deterioration in the behavior of the Edomites, rulers, inhabitants. We only have to look at the behavior of Edom in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, when Moses and the Israelites requested to pass through the land instead of an elongated journey. And the king of Edom at that time refused to help him in any way. And this refusal, of course, made the journey of the Israelites much more disheartening and dangerous. Edom even threatened violence. Now, it would have cost them really nothing and instead would have been a nice, kind, goodwill gesture. But it didn't happen, did it? Was it suspicion of the strangers? Was it fear? It certainly wasn't brother, brotherly love. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse seven, Israel was still commanded by God to treat the Edomites as brothers. God was directing Israel to leave the judgment of those who had hurt them up to him and try to love those who had acted with enmity against them, even if they were regarded as brothers. Now, you, you'll know that you know, Saul and David both had battles with the Edomites. And that enmity from the Edomites just festered and seethed. Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 5, God says, you have had a never-ending hatred. How true that was. They did have two important factors in their favor. It was situated along the great trade routes between Syria and Egypt. So there were big profits to be made in that respect. The trade brought business and the Edomites grew wealthy as it demanded tolls and taxes from the travelers in their caravan processions. I'm given to believe that there was also a very good source of copper in that area. The second factor was the natural security brought about by the height of those red sandstone cliffs, which rose many thousands of feet and gave natural fortifications. This meant the Edomites could wage battle, extract tribute from those passing through the land, and safely retreat from the outsiders. Right, we're gonna start the book eventually. We can liken it to a court of law proceedings. Many competent commentators have said that they believe that the book of Obadiah follows the covenant lawsuit form of address, something that was um, certainly a common circumstance in the ancient Near East. That means that this type of message, which many of the other written prophets also used, there may be seen certain prescribed divisions 
They're obvious. Let me explain that one a little bit more. At its most basic, we would have a description of the scene of a judgment, and then a speech is given by the presiding judge. The speech will include an address to the defendant. This will include any reprimand based on an accusation, and also a declaration that the accused has no defense. No arguments, no defense. Then there will be a pronouncement of guilt and the sentence to be delivered. It's a little different to the idea of the common court of law we're familiar with where we have a defense brief, you have a prosecutor and they argue and argue and eventually there's a decision made and a verdict. So let's have a look at this from the very, just the first verse, Obadiah chapter one. <laughs> it's only chapter one, isn't it? Verse one, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations saying, arise and let us rise up against her for battle. First one uses a messenger, some translations might use the word ambassador. I think that's about the only two I've spotted. In that first verse it says, thus says, is it really the word says, or could it in fact be the word said? It makes something of a real difference. The Jewish Bible scholar, Dr. Baruch Korman said, and I quote him as follows, if your Bible says, thus says the Lord, it's been translated incorrectly. The word that appears here is written in the past tense, it's said. The past tense, use of this verb confirms God's promise. In God's eyes, and therefore it would be right to view it in this way through our eyes too, this prophecy is confirmed, it will happen. And because God has said it, it's as good as already done. I found a lot of translations that just said, thus says. I did find some other ones, one of which was the complete Jewish Bible. I thought, well, I think they'd get it right, wouldn't they? It's something to think about. It's something to think about. He said it. He's not saying it. He said it, and it's done. The other little interesting thing about that verse is he uses the words Lord God. Now that's unusual because he's putting Adonai and Yahweh together, which doesn't come up that much at times. It's interesting. So he's had a vision, he's reporting something akin to hot off the press. News report from the Lord. Nations are gathering at war, a war that will deal with Edom and diminish her as we'll find out shortly. The remaining verses are a comprehensive speech given by the judge, which of course in this case is God speaking through the prophet. There's now gonna be three offenses declared and outlined between verse two and verse nine, but I'll read from verse two to verse four, because I wanna have a look at each offense and try and explain them to you. Verses two to four. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. What an explosive opening to these verses. Stop having the overblown attitude that you're the best around. You're going to be small. In fact, the least of any of the nations, and you'll be loathed. The pride of your heart has deceived you. The outstanding, the outstanding stain on Edom's national character was pride. The Hebrew word for pride is zodon. 
and comes from a verb meaning to boil up. It creates a picture of pride as water boiling up under pressure in a cooking pot. So the, the proud person is like a bubble thrusting itself up, but is in actual fact hollow. They boast about their high impregnable defenses, the clefts in the rock, the lack of fear from enemies. They're like eagles, they nest in the stars. Notice the metaphors and the similes there. But so fitting as to the terrain and the boasting. It matters not, said God. It matters not that you have these structures. Build as high as you like. Live as high as you desire. I'll still bring you down. And you'll be down to earth. And it will be with utter humiliation. You who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? And God declares, I will. No matter how high you think you can ascend, you will not evade my judgment. Chuck Misler makes an interesting point. Throughout Israel's history, the eagle has been the traditional insignia of many stated enemies. Herod, Rome, Nazi Germany, Britain, Russia. You think of anyone else with an eagle that could start to fit in there at present? Now why would that be, I wonder? What reason? Second event, second offense, verses five to seven. If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off. Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Oh, how Esau shall be searched out. How his hidden treasures shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. What's God saying here through the prophet Obadiah? Thieves come into your property and they steal, but they're always selective. They don't take everything. They don't empty your whole house as anyone here who's ever been burgled will testify. They pick and choose the best items. If the grape gatherers come and pick the harvest, don't they always leave a few gleanings? Of course they do. However, when God deals with you, there'll be nothing left at all. Nothing to salvage or be of use whatsoever. The verses read on, Edomites, think about your alliances, your so-called friends from other nations. You think that you can trust them completely. You think these networks will help in keeping you even more secure from enemies. Not so at all. You don't understand, Edom, the hearts and minds of others. Betrayal will come about and you will suffer accordingly. Think about modern day political tactics and maneuvers. There are nuclear warheads in my back shed. Well, let's talk this one over. We all want peace, don't we? We want to be friends and allies. Let's use our diplomatic talents, seek common goals, and so on. Obadiah is saying, even then, no one can be trusted because eventually deception, division, betrayal will occur. A nation is only ever truly secure when it has a real, a committed relationship with Almighty God. God exalts a nation but not when those in power allow this relationship to become a source of personal and blatant pride. Look at the nations that have never lasted in history. Egyptians, gone. Babylonians, gone. Syrians, gone. Medo-Persians, gone. Greek and Roman, both gone. Doesn't that clearly tell us something about where they stood with God and where they ended up? The third and final offense, verses eight and nine. 
Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Timon, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. More prideful boasting is being commented on by the prophet. Edom has developed, or had developed, a reputation for wisdom and sages. Eliphaz, one of the friends of the old long-suffering Job, was a Timonite. And in other words, he was from Edom. And in the book of Job, he was considered a wise man, in human terms. And we find various references to the apparent wisdom in Edom in books like Jeremiah chapter 49, just one. God's judgment against the Edomites would bring them foolish and incompetent leadership. In the present day, could this be one way God may show his displeasure against a nation? Can you think of any examples where he might be showing his displeasure with leaders presently? The first declaration of guilt is verse 10. For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. Israel's not depicted to Edom as simply a rival nation, but as your brother, Jacob. Was there any better of example of pride in that statement? Edom's treatment of Israel will be even clearer in a few minutes. Personal superiority lends itself to looking down on others, seeing them as inferior. And then, of course, the mistreatment follows. The Edomites failed to hold to brotherly love with family relationships. For them, it had ceased to exist. It was unimportant to them. On the other hand, God takes a serious view of this and sees such relationships as something more sacred. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 7. You shall not despise an Edomite, God tells the Israelites, for he is your brother. Second genera- uh, declaration of guilt, verse 11. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. Here it starts to degenerate. The enemies have arrived. They've entered the gates of Judah. The Edomites stand back with an aloof attitude and do absolutely nothing. The sin of omission is bad enough against others. It's even worse when their cousins are under attack. They may as well have been one of the attackers at that point. Were they like Cain when God asked about the whereabouts of Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23 reminds us when it speaks of the sin that will find you out. And the sin it speaks of is the sin of doing nothing. Sometimes doing nothing is a great sin. The third declaration of guilt, 12 to 14. As we read these verses, count the number of times the phrases you should not or nor should you come into play. This is an absolutely heavenly blast of God's wrath against the Edomites. But you should not have gaze on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity. Nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Nor should you have spoken proudly in their day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped. 
nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. Did you see the little first word there once again? A word that changes the direction of where we might have thought things were going. But. Kick them when they're down, keep right on kicking, repeat the sin, repeat it. It gets easier to commit each time. So it was for the Edomites. Look at the progression of the behavior of the word clues, like steps on a pathway of hatred. Gaze on the captivity. Rejoice, speak proudly against the suffering of the cousins. Enter as intruders into the city walls. The Edomite's aloof attitude is now led onto becoming active partners in the actual attack. The stealing of wealth, possessions occurs, and even worse, they assist in the capture of fugitives and survivors and hand them over to the enemy. I was reminded in my reading of the later events in history when the Herod dynasty, descendants of the Edomites, although by then, of course, they were called Idumeans, carried on their vile behavior. Herod the Great, slaughter of the babies in an effort to try and get rid of Christ. Herod Antipas, who executed John the baptizer. Jesus called him that fox which is a very derogatory word when you look through that one. Jesus died on a cross to redeem all of humanity. Herod died in misery and torment. So, as in a regular court of law, where in a different life I spent many hours, I hasten to add on the right side of the prisoner's dock, we've had the evidence presented, and the presiding judge delivers the verdict against this wicked Accused nation, verses 15, 16, thanks. For the day of the Lord upon all nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. The day of the Lord upon all nations is near. This has the implication in which God's judgment against Edom was just the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. The Edomites cursed Israel, so they were cursed. If we want to be blessed, we should bless Israel and the Jewish people. The Edomites had drank up on the conquest of Jerusalem on God's holy hill. Well, they will most certainly drink again, the prophet says, but this time they will be drinking from a cup that contains not wine, but the Lord's righteous wrath. They will drink more than their fill. Justice will be done and will be seen to be done. Notice, though, that the words are also being directed not just to Edom, but now seems to be turning to all nations. This second prophecy is starting to broaden in its scope, so let's just read the last four verses, 17 to 21. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame but the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. The south shall possess the mountains of Esau, the lowland shall possess Philistia. They shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. Benjamin shall possess Gilead, and the captives of this host of the children of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. The captives of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the south. Then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The kingdom shall be the Lord's. The very first word in verse 17. But 
There it is again. We know what happens when he says that. God promises deliverance and a holy cleansing from the defilement of his mountain, Mount Zion. Now, of course, Israel has sin sinned in the past and there's been consequences for their sins, but God would cleanse and restore the house of Jacob and not the house of Esau or the Edomites. He shifts from water to fire, the house of Jacob, the southern kingdom will be likened to a fire. House of Joseph, the northern kingdom will be like a flame. And the house of Esau will be absolute ashes. Nothing will survive, no survivors. God's spoken, his decision has been made, and the ungodly face the fire. Five years after the sacking of Jerusalem in 586 BC, the Babylonians crushed the Edomites. In time to come, the Persians conquered and slaughtered Edomites by the thousand. In 120 BC, the Maccabees, a Jewish rebel army, added to this. Another Jewish leader, John Hyrcanus, forced the Edomites to become nominal Jews and accept circumcision. Of course, later still, we had the violence of the Edomite, Edomian Herod dynasty, but then you've got the Roman invasion in AD 70, and the remnants of Edom were just wiped out. In Malachi chapter one, verse four, we're told that Edom had once boasted, we have been impoverished but we will return and build the desolate places. And then God spoke. They may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. There's a concept here known as lex talionis. It's where God would approximate his wrath against Edom corresponding to the sins they've committed against his people. It's simply a law of retribution. Some people might call it uh, paid in like coin. He would destroy the military and allow other nations to take over the land. And the lands will be redistributed and returned to God's people, such as the lands of the Edomites, Philistines, the Arabs, the Babylonians, all of it in time to come. So the ramifications are not just against or towards Edom, but for all nations to be aware of this prophecy and take very good notice. There's a word in verse 21 which says, it uses the word saviors. Some people would argue that might be better translated as deliverers. These deliverers shall come to Mount Zion. The idea isn't that there are many of them in the ultimate sense. The inference is plain. Edom's going to be destroyed and there will be no deliverers for them. However, if you dig a little bit deeper with that word, the Hebrew word is yosho. It's a verb. It's not a noun. And it refers to a sense of being rescued just like us when Jesus rescued us from our sins. Kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of the Lord where and when he shall reign forever and ever. When we think of thy kingdom come, that should be a, something on our lips often. He tells us that the day of the Lord is God at work, not only in the relatively near future of his prophecy in this book, and finally at the end of time as God determines but he's at work in the lives of his people at all times. Charles Spurgeon says, there are two great certainties about things that shall come to pass. One is that God knows, and the other is that we do not know, but it will happen without any shadow of a doubt. It shouldn't stop us from behaving faithfully as his children any day of the week. Despite the invective language used against the Edomites, it is a prophecy of great hope. Israel's been encouraged that God had not forgotten his covenantal promises, and they were to look towards the day when the enemies of God are crushed and the people of God are vindicated. He provides ample examples to condemn the prideful acts of our lost world. 
You know, <laughs> in many respects, we, I think we could say we're living in a modern Edom. The parallels between then and now are evident. He's writing to the Edomites, but he's also writing to the people of God, to us. He makes no overt references to the Lord Jesus. However, the prophecy of God's coming kingdom certainly concludes in the person and the work of Christ. Christ is the only savior who alone came to purchase our salvation with his own life. Those people who are rescued through the gospel will be more and more evident as the end of the age draws near. Stay true to the Lord and he will overcome all our difficulties and on our behalf. Unlike Edom, we must be willing to help others when they experience times of need. Reach out when someone needs a hand, just like the Lord reached out to us and continues to reach out to all people. Eden was destroyed because of its great pride and selfishness. Having pride means we're forgetting God and his proper place in our lives. Preventing pride means we can concentrate on being ever thankful to God and give him honor in all things. Focus on him, not self. Final comments. This is not what I originally wrote. <laughs> um, what I originally wrote, I think, was a, probably a bit too blunt. Um, but I wanted to be, try and be as honest as I could. But I really felt uh, the Lord's Spirit was saying, no, 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 there's something else you can say instead. Say that, say it. <laughs> as I reread the book of Obadiah, I was very much reminded of what happens when any of us move away from our relationship with God. When we take it upon ourselves that we no longer need him or want to rely on him. When pride manifests, starts to simmer, takes over, dominates our whole life, every aspect of it. When the Lord simply has not even a corner in our lives to reside in. When that pride becomes the idol, when it becomes arrogance, possibly hatred towards another, when it corrupts thought processes, damages relationships in the workplace, friends, neighbors, family, when it becomes toxic and poisons your very life. Why would we want it like that? Then we come to Obadiah and see there is the wonderful hope that comes from God and his promises. I was drawn back to the verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We know it well. If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, it was directed, of course, to Solomon and the Israel but the promises are still true and because the same God who made those promises still reigns in the heavens and will continue to respond to any of his humble praying people today like us, we hope. Humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, turn from anything that's deemed wicked. The only reliable way, the only true way out of pride and to deal with it is to keep our trust firmly on the Lord Jesus. Maintain our relationship, our faith in him. It's precious, isn't it? Keep short accounts with God, as someone used to remind me. Let the Holy Spirit alert us when it's time to pull our head in and be the person God wants us to be. We have a living, loving Savior ready to guide, direct our lives, give us the direction we need to be heading in. Help us when we stumble, pick us up, and put us back on the right track. I pray and trust that this shortest book of the Old Testament has been a warning bell for us all, but also a reassurance of the glory of the risen Christ that is to come. As someone said, we have nothing to be proud of except 
Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. May we be faithful as he is faithful and as he always will be. Let's pray, folks. Father, we just thank you for our time in your word. What a reminder of what pride can do in a nation's life, in their very life force, how it poisons. And we see some of that going on, certainly a lot of it going on in the world at present, round the globe. We see what it does, and we see what it does to them when they lose sight of you, and they have no relationship with you in their lives. Father, we just thank you again. We thank you for the lessons that you continually teach us. Sometimes we're weak, Lord, we know that. We lose sight of things that need to be attended to, or things that need to be changed, things that need to be righted. So we pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, you'll be with us. Give us traveling mercies, we pray. And may we just dwell, perhaps, on some aspect that has come up this afternoon that might be relevant to our lives. And as always, we just thank you again, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.